In May of 2017, at the Contact in the Desert event at Joshua Tree, paranormal radio show host Heather Wade claimed to have been given a leaked copy of the George H.W. Bush, also known as Bush 41, initial UFO briefing document. I have been skeptical of this document until recently when I came across a Tom DeLong interview with his old roommate, Benji Weatherly. If what I'm about to lay out isn't true, it sure makes great fiction. There are a lot of things to say about the briefing document. The first one I want to bring forward is the length. At 47 pages, this is a document making a lot of claims that risk exposure and counter-informational leaks. Think of it this way. When you are trying to lie to your spouse, do you lay out an excessively long story filled with details and notations and conversations with your friends that aren't true and can still be checked out? Or do you keep it brief and concise? 47, by the way, is a perfect number in numerology. If you think the number of pages is meaningless, I would remind you of the president Bush was replacing. In college, I took a course called Writing for Business. One particular class was on writing a bad newsletter. The synthesis of the lesson being, always put the bad news up front and the good news at the end. It is my thesis that this is the nature of this very likely authentic document. The document is divided into six parts. To most clearly explain this document, I need to create a timeline to express the document's positioning best. So I'm now I, I fly out to this airport and I, I sit at a table uh, in a restaurant at the airport, no one's in there, and this gentleman sits down and the waiter comes up, he waves off the waiter, and he looks me in the eye and says, it was the Cold War and we found a life form. Um, and, there, and, and just like my company's going to be building, you know, this, this uh, electromagnetic craft that really can do the same thing to time that I've been telling you about, other civilizations have that too, which means you can traverse those distances of space. And what you have to think about is what happened when we first discovered that and what did we do about it? And there's no, you know, you got to look at 47 in a very peculiar way. 90 days after the Roswell event, the CIA was created, the Air Force was separated from the Army, the National Security Act was created, and all those things are mechanisms to start learning more and to start getting private industry off the ground. So that had nothing to do with World War II? You think it had to do with aliens? Oh, I absolutely think it. Well, it, both, because what, uh, what I believe crashed at Roswell was... Um, well, I believe it was German from Argentina, but it had hallmarks and technology based on alien technology. So, so let's stick a pin in that data point. Roswell happened and is the starting point for the UFO phenomenon in the modern era. This is a briefing to a current president, so the end date of the timeline is January 8th, 1989. Stick a pin in that. In a moment, what I saw should become quite clear. The bulk of the pages belong to the sections focused on Roswell, the players that were involved at the time, and the Aztec New Mexico crash of March 25th, 1948, or eight months after the Roswell crash. In fact, other than undated references to the Eisenhower administration, which gives a maximum date of January 1961, the document gives little, if any, information of what has occurred in between the Aztec crash where a sardonic alien, as described by Whitley Strieber, teases us about our inability to comprehend the situation, and the end of the document, which lays out the statement of position, which is one of complete diplomatic status for all ET operating on the planet peacefully, vis-a-vis -vis men in black. I'll fully acknowledge, it's a lot to swallow. In particular, um, they came out as arts parts on Arts Bell a long time ago, and they're different layers of bismuth and mag magnesium. But I, uh, but this one came from a crash in '48, not the '47, and I know nothing more about it. But I don't think it's anything they're coming here with a chain of custody and say this came from Air Force or something mm -hmm. like that. What catches my eye are three statements by the Aztec extraterrestrial in the section titled "Select and Condensed Conversations with the Aztec New Mexico EBE." The first statement involves the Eben explaining that his culture 
manipulates DNA to live long periods of time. It seems important to point out that Sumerian kings live for long periods of time. Lavenda, in fact, makes the point in man regarding the DNA manipulation issue that had Nazis had access to CRISPR technology, they would have used it to perfect the German race. We thank you, Guardians, for putting your lives on the line. We could not risk the lives of our own sovereign citizens. Every citizen is born exactly as designed by the community. Impeccable, both physically and mentally. We control the DNA of our progeny, germinating them in birthing pods. Yes, I prefer to make people the old-fashioned way. Now, this is why it seems to me that the Ebens would first choose Nazi Germany to infiltrate, and why World War II was an ET race. The Nazis were the closest ideologically to this ancient and stranded race. Second, the Eben acknowledges that his people have been on Earth before and left structures to prove it. For some reason, this statement screams Atlantis, another confirmed data point from secret machines of fire within. What is most interesting about the statement is that the Eben acknowledges that they can and would manipulate the government of the nation where the footings can be found so they can go investigate the veracity of their claim. And third, there seems to be a series of drops in the conversation that appear convenient and reassuring. For example, the Eben says that his people have no government, which must have been reassuring that we weren't being absorbed into a galactic federation or church, low man on the totem pole and all. And yet, the document says that representatives entered into a treaty signed by Eisenhower. If there's no government amongst the beings, then the only beings contracted to that document in the quantum field would have been the few Eben that signed it, or whatever they do. If true, I'm certainly found it quite quaint and completely effective at deceiving us. Every other Eben is free to do what they want, like abduct people and create hybrid children. The most troubling of the claims the document makes is that we were given children of theirs to raise. I would like to play an important passage from Secret Machines of Fire Within, narrated by Paul Costanza. I keep thinking about bees, said Jennifer, almost dreamily. One hand had moved to the flesh on the back of her neck, as if she was looking for the place where the surgery had happened all those years ago. She was talking to suppress the sense of violation, of outrage, talking to stop herself shrinking away from the past, like she was cringing at the feel of a bug on her skin. Buzzing around me, keep dreaming of them. Golden bees, I kept seeing them. This image from Crete in particular, from Crete? asked Tamika, her tone suddenly urgent. An ancient Minoan necklace thing. Two gold bees. You sure they were bees? I thought so. I suppose they could have been wasps. Like yellow jackets? I suppose. Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? said Tamika, now her old self, confident and wry. It was comforting to hear her like this. Let's see. Bees pollinate crops and flowers. They make honey. They live in symbiosis with mankind and, literally, sweeten our existence, so that everyone starts freaking out the moment we suspect the bee population is in decline. I suppose so, said Jennifer. Girl, we haven't even got started yet. Think about it. When a bee stings you, it loses a part of itself. Like it's cutting off a limb or something. It stings you. It's gonna die. Not so for a wasp, which, apart from making nothing but more wasps, is the insect equivalent of the guy who cuts you for looking at his girlfriend. Wasps are not our friends, and they do not come in peace. You ever heard people worrying about a decline in the wasp population? Can't say I have. And with good reason. Now, think of it for a second. Those things in your head, in your dreams, are they bees or wasps? Jennifer thought. Her answer was entirely based on impressions she could neither defend nor explain. But when she spoke, it was with absolute certainty. Wasps, 
she said. Yeah, said Tamika. That's what I figured. What does it mean? asked Jennifer. Means we're in trouble, said Tamika. In nature, there is a precedence for this behavior. Most importantly, it's what's lacking from the Aztec conversations. No directed panspermia, no genetic manipulation of the DNA molecule, and my favorite, we're surprised you forgot about us. The thesis that we are a species with amnesia is predicated on a trauma that caused it. That trauma was the cataclysm 12,900 years ago. Another important element of the document to consider is that the children arrive in a state of suspended animation. There is an entire section of gods called Pyramidiots where Lavenda points to the opening of the mouth ceremony as a ritual of reanimation after deep space travel. Recently, Melinda Leslie shared that Jim Semivan of To The Stars Academy told her that the UFO ET issue is, quote, not a threat. This is an interesting position since God's lays out that mankind was created as a workforce, and Chasing Shadows unabashedly says Dreamland was infiltrated on behalf of an outside and sinister organization willing to kill. There was a species of mankind stranded on Earth in great antiquity, who are telepathic and ancient in modern terms. They planted the DNA molecule here in great antiquity. Their DNA has then mixed with ours over the ages. In 1979, this happened. No, not really. <laughs> I know from the, uh, my boss's son. He was in the CIA through the 70s and 80s and 90s that uh, I used to hear from him occasionally. And I know that he told me that in 1979, uh, all the, we had 27 or 29 aliens working in S4 at that time, and other black projects, that uh, something happened, that the whole thing kind of blew up, and they all left, got into a large craft, and they all left and went to the Pleiades star system. You mean something happened like there was a altercation, yeah. violence, fight some, of some sort? Some kind of altercation. And in September 1983, this happened. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war. This seems oddly appropriate to point out. Ronald Reagan survived the shooting. Every president since then has survived. These beings didn't crash their craft. They inserted themselves into the situation by crashing a craft. CE5 contact is about us, we, the people of Earth, deciding that we're ready for contact. Here's that final nugget that I want to deliver regarding the document and Tom DeLong. January 16th, 2020, an interview was published by Bone Whale Magazine. What makes this interview unique is that the interview was conducted by Benji Weatherly, Tom's roommate before either of them were famous. Now, I'm willing to bet that the formal interview occurred either near or on January 8th, 2020 the 31-year anniversary of the Bush 41 briefing document. In the interview, Tom says the following about synchronicities, in particular, commenting on the Nimitz carrier, 
which he played on just after the onset of the first Gulf War. The first war, incidentally, George H.W. Bush engaged in when he became president. Tom says, quote, Well, you start to learn. I've met a lot of people associated with the program on this stuff, whether in the Defense Department or in the intelligence community, which are many of the three-letter agencies. And one of the things they toss around a lot is, they always say there are no coincidences when it comes to this subject. So anything that has a pattern, and anything that seems weird, they take very seriously. It's really strange how everything works. It's like on my coast, on the only carrier I've ever been on, and it's just weird. What Tom just described, incidentally, is the Kurt Russell effect. More precisely, Tom also just said that the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and many three-letter agencies track the patterns created by what the document calls transmorphic entities, a type of being described as residing outside of space and time in the briefing, something echoed in Lavenda's research journal. At the bottom of the Bone Whale interview is the cover page of the Bush 41 briefing. Again, there are no coincidences. This might actually be a good time to ask yourself whether Tom DeLong is face-palming or high-fiving one of his oldest and best friends. You don't write a fake document and do so by skipping 30 years of historical data. You do start with the bad news and end with the good news. A link to the full document can be found in the description below. Like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to leave me a comment down below. Peace.